Well, that's not that unusual, actually. There are other world cities that are going down that route, particularly in Europe. Uh, Copenhagen will probably be the first city to get 100% renewable energy. They have a target in place for uh, doing that by 2025. So that will be five years earlier than us if we were to actually do that by 2030. So it makes common sense to start off with a 100% renewable energy policy. The problems that you have with having a target like 20% or 30% or even 50% it's really supermarket trolley renewable energies. People walking around saying, I have one of these, I have one of these, got no idea if it's actually going to deliver for them. So it's important to start off with a 100% renewable energy policy to discipline you, to force you to work out what components of the different sorts of renewable energy generation and supply and how much quantum of each, and particularly to overcome the intermittency of renewable energy that you need. You can have sub-targets to get you there, but it's extremely important from a technical point of view to have a 100% renewable energy policy first so that you do the correct calculations because you're replacing a fossil fuel grid and you cannot do that with a random selection of solar and wind or other technologies. They've got to work together. Each city is different, but the, uh, the way you go about doing it is the same. So um, in Sydney, I prepared them a blueprint, uh, which we converted into a green infrastructure plan. So this was less than four years ago. So what we've seen Sydney being able to do today and what it's planning to do by 2030, that's all been de developed in the last three or four years, and the projects that are underway at the moment and so on. So when we actually looked at, so following on from the question that you just asked me, when we actually looked at um, what technologies that we needed, uh, cities are very different from rural locations. Uh, we use con huge amounts of energy, but we have little land space to actually put things on. We have lots of roofs, but they're at the top of very tall buildings, which in themselves represent only a small fraction of those buildings. So we know, for example, that when we did our renewable energy master plan, we could not get more than 18% of renewable energy in the city itself that is conventional solar and wind, mainly solar. And that's because of the physical limitations of a city in contrast to how much energy it's consuming. But we didn't also want to invest in remote renewables. Remote renewables have the same problems as remote fossil fuel power stations. But most of the energy is lost. Uh, energy is lost in the uh, grid trans transmission and distribution network. Uh, we also aligned our Renewable Energy Master Plan along with our other master plans with our Climate Change Adaptation Plan. So we don't want overhead poles and wires, which is what you get with remote systems. All our infrastructure is underground so that it's not blown down by the first storm or hurricane that comes along or burned down by some bushfire or whatever. So it is important to move away from centralised energy to decentralised energy. That's where the huge elements of efficiency are able to be had. It also means that we can do quite clever things just outside the city to supplement the renewable electricity inside the city to turn it into a 100% renewable energy city. So this is moving on beyond the conventional wisdom about what people think renewable energy is. So we know, for example, that we don't actually need more than 30% renewable electricity. But the time you take into account energy efficiency and the recovery of waste, waste energy and that sort of thing, you, putting more than 30% renewable electricity into the city would be a waste. Um, so what we did establish that actually uh, Sydney um, uses huge amounts of thermal energy. It uses heating, it uses hot water. Its biggest thermal energy use is air conditioning. So that's why we developed the Tri-Generation Master Plan initially fueled by natural gas to get the uh, infrastructure up and running, but designed in such a way that natural gas can be replaced by renewable gas. Now our strategy is, and the, what the master plan showed, that we needed 30% renewable electricity and 70% tri-generation. 70% tri-generation gives us 70% renewable electricity to add to the 30% and 100% of the heating and cooling that we need when we combine all of the master plans together. So where does a renewable gas come from? Waste. So we're not growing energy crops or anything like that. There are two types of waste. Um, and we looked beyond the city, and we developed what's called a proximity zone. 
as you know, as we've had in Australia and you're having here in California, uh, uh, centralized power generation, the grid, is hugely increasing people's electricity bills. Most of that's driven by high network charges through uh, capital investment in big grids, particularly from renewables. So we didn't want to create any more costs for consumers. So we developed a proximity principle. Um, so we're not taking any theoretical electrons from Queensland or from Victoria or even outback New South Wales. 250 kilometres pretty much covers Greater uh, Sydney and the surrounding uh, rural area, which is important to us. And so what we're doing with the rural area is what we call wet waste. So this is waste like animal manures, um, uh, chicken litter, pig, cow, sheep manure. Um, that can be converted into renewable gas. Now that's called biogas, and there are examples in Australia and in California where that biogas is used to generate electricity and put into the electricity grid. The only problem with that is that when you generate electricity from a, a thermal source, you get about one-third electricity, two-thirds of heat. The heat's thrown away, and if you just use biogas on its own without upgrading it, you don't even get that. Um, uh, evidence shows that in New South Wales you get between 15 and 30 percent. Uh, on average, 20 percent recovery from energy. If you convert that gas into a substitute natural gas by a bit of upgrading technology, then you recover 80 percent of the primary renewable energy resource because that gas is now not being uh, consumed at that remote location. It's being transported into the city where that can supply cogeneration, tri-generation, district heating and also transport. So this is how you get rid of the fossil fuels for transport as well. Decentralized energy is important from an economic point of view because um, at the moment um, renewable technologies that connect to the grid are treated as if they're coal-fired power stations. So however little the distance that the renewable electricity is going, they're charged as if they're a remote power station, so they pay full network charges. So governments in trying to overcome that and to make renewables economic pay feeding tariffs, give grants for something that they could actually make economic by removing the regulatory barriers to renewable energy. We're talking mainly about decentralized energy technologies. Electricity bills are so high, and 60% of electricity bills is network charges. So what we're doing in Australia, and what's happening elsewhere around the world, in Germany, in Scandinavia, in the UK, South Korea, even India and China are doing this, is getting behind the meter, not using the grid. As much as that you can get behind the meter is where you make your real economic savings. Then you see decentralized energy is actually cheaper than centralized energy. So it doesn't need all this infrastructure to remove remote electrons. The distribution network, the local distribution network, is important. Um, so we comfort our network operators with the fact that uh, at the moment they have what we call is a passive distribution network. They're just shifting remote electrons through the transmission grid into the distribution network. That's what we call a passive network. It's all one way. We're turning that effectively into an active network, two-way flows of electricity. Now, the reason we call this decentralized energy instead of distributed generation or embedded generation is that the concept of decentralized energy is to generate no more energy than the city previously used. And we worked with the electricity network operator to work out at particular points on their network, generally the high voltage network, the 11,000 volt network, how much energy could we input here, how much could we input there, so that we were not exporting to the grid. Because if you start to generate more electricity than is being consumed, you have to augment and that will reinforce the network. So this is a different concept to centralized energy, which builds big power stations to whack in huge amounts of electric power into a huge transmission grid, and then that's broken down by transformers to the distribution networks. That's completely opposite of that. So decentralized energy, we feel, is a term that represents more truly what we're doing than distributed generation or embedded generation, or that is connected into the distribution network. It's just simple uh, education for the public to understand what you're doing. It's just much easier for them to think, well, decentralized energy sounds the opposite of centralized energy. You talk to them about distributed generation or embedded generation, they won't know what you're talking about. The city is quite a wealthy city. 
but it's not wealthy enough. It could not do this on its own. It hasn't got nowhere near the amount of money to do that. And that's the same problem that confronts cities and state governments all around the world. So it's really about being smart with your money. Where are the market failures? What can the city do that the private sector can't do? Because we find, as my experience in the UK shows, that the private sector can probably do about 90 to 95 percent of it. But it's that last few miles of hard road that just doesn't work for them economically. So where are the market failures? So we did a number of things. Uh, so first of all, we, we did sh show by doing, which is a principle that I developed in the UK. You cannot expect others to do things you're not prepared to do yourself. So we've had a very aggressive program of reducing our own emissions, not by 2030, but a bit about half the time. Uh, within the last, within the first three years of my coming here, so to the end of the last financial year, we reduced greenhouse gas emissions from, a, from zero to 20% reduction. We've got major contracts under, underway at the moment that will double that. So we're well ahead in terms of getting to that 70% uh, reduction emission target. And we have a plan of each of the components that deliver that, and that includes waste, water, and, and all the other things. So the big challenge is the local government area, which is by far the biggest chunk, 90, 95% of what we need to do. So how do we get the private sector to participate and to invest? One of the first things we did was establish the Better Buildings Partnership, which is similar to what I did in London. Uh, in London, I, I found out that 60% of the commercial real estate was owned by 20 landlords. Once you get beyond that, it cliff edge, it falls off the cliff edge, and you get many thousands of small landlords owning myriads of small properties. So um, you don't design a system to, to deal with that. It just makes it too hard. Um, so in Sydney, when we looked at that, I found that 13 landlords own 60% of the commercial real estate before it cliff edged down to the myriad of smaller landlords. We deal with small landlords and tenants through our City Switch program, um, but essentially it was important to us to target the big landlords and developers in the city. These are the ones that have got reputation. These are the companies that are, have international, they're international, they have, have uh, real estate all around the world. And some of the companies that I'm dealing with in Sydney are the same companies that I dealt with in London. And so what you need is a first mover. I won't say who the first mover was. But essentially, what we're doing here is increasing, from their point of view, their green star rating, or your leads rating, whatever you call it over here. Um, and, the, and the thing with the property market is, is that the, the big driver is anchor tenants. Keeping your anchor tenants or attracting anchor tenants. You don't, get, you don't keep your anchor tenants you're probably unlikely to fill up the rest of your office space with the smaller tenants. So you just need that uh, tip over on the economics. So tenants want to occupy the greenest buildings. So if somebody can move from a three star to a four star to a five star or go beyond five or six star, which is what's happening in, in Sydney, then they get the anchor tenants. Now the biggest expense to landlords is what we call voids. That is the number of weeks that your property is unoccupied. That's costing you millions. If you go in a huge amount of real estate, that could, could be costing you millions of dollars a week. That's the kind of money that we're talking about. So spending a bit of money on environmental improvements is negligible compared to the risk of having unoccupied buildings. Once, once somebody moves, everyone else has to move because they can't afford for their competitors to have greener buildings than they have. So we were able to get all 13 of the major landlords signed up to the same 70% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions targets, the same 100% local energy targets, the same water and recycling targets by 2030. So they're all signed up to Sustainable Sydney 2030, which is the overarching plan that we have for this. Um, the next bit I did was how do we actually deal with the tenants of those buildings? Because now the landlords are happy to invest in the landlord side of the property, the common areas, but they have a really hard time investing their capital in the tenanted part of the buildings when the tenants make the financial savings for a reduced energy and water bill. So that was another problem I had to overcome. We did that through what's called environmental upgrade agreements. And we got legislation was passed in New South Wales State Government. And that works very simply. Um, the city governments, um, when they collect their rates, they can put charges on buildings. So if a landlord goes broke, you've got the property in which to collect your rates from. So the tax man does the same thing. So they're the, they're the, they're the primary debtors, they collect that money. So within local government legislation, we had the power to put charges on properties. 
voluntarily, somebody wants to do that, so it has to be voluntary. So we use that mechanism to de-risk the finance for investing in, in uh, environmental improvements. So how does that work? Well, we've been working with the big banks and the big lending institutions to understand about the risk of finance. And uh, so an interest rate of 10% can very quickly get up to 30% because of the risk of you defaulting. We all know that with our mortgages and you know, you're buying your own house and everything. You're paying far more in interest rate than you actually need to, but much of what you're paying is to de-risk that lending of the lender to you. So what we did with the lenders was to say, we'll collect the debt for you. We're not subject to the debt, but we'll establish an environmental charge. And if the landlord goes into liquidation, we'll get your money back. So that reduces the cost of finance by about two or three times, because you've now delivered to the lender a low-risk financial lending regime. So why would the tenants pay the environmental charge? Because it's voluntary. So although we've got legislation, it's not compulsory. Well, the environmental charge is written in legislation. We've got some clever formulas in there where the, uh, the landlord or their consultants have to demonstrate that the cost of the environmental charge, which is paid like a monthly charge, is equal or less than the savings they would get from the reduced energy and water uh, bills. So what essentially you're doing is shifting the cost from energy and water to, to a property charge. Um, and that's typically done over five years. There are some that are two years, some that it depends on the length of the tenancy. At the end of that period, so whether it's two or five years, the environmental charge finishes because it's all been paid off and the tenant suddenly gets in their you know, year six if they're on a five-year agreement, a huge reduction in their energy and water bills, which they now claim the full benefits for. So when a, a large company, so like a, an insurance company that's occupying a big office building, they write that down over a period of time. So it looks incredibly good to them because they're paying an environmental charge for the first five years that is equal or less than what they would have paid in energy and water bills, but they're writing it down over a longer period of time. It's virtually negligible, it comes to nothing. So that's really incentivized investment uh, in uh, environmental improvements. And so one of the first big projects, which was a $26.5 million project, was a tri-generation precinct that had combined a new development with the existing development around it, supplying about 3,600 households, offices and hotels in that area. And we're now working on that precinct to see if we can extend that across to uh, where it just so happens, a huge university across the road. Um, and from there, we can expand the system. So that's just one example of one precinct that was in the tri-generation master plan and in the renewable energy master plan that the council's not actually funding. It set up these mechanisms to enable the private sector to fund. The bit that we will fund is the thermal network itself. So to connect those two sites, that's the bit that the, uh, the private sector can't fund. It just takes them over their return on investment. So that's an area of market failure. So it costs the council relatively little to put that infrastructure in to connect those two sites up together. So that makes sense for the council to invest its money. So it's spending nowhere near as much as the overall project as a whole. And we measure that by what we call the cost of carbon abatement. So how much money do we have to spend to get a tonne of carbon abatement? So for example, a really good project would be $25 a tonne. A project that was $250 a tonne is not a good project and we wouldn't put any money into that. So we're actually using carbon abatement as currency got nothing to do with emissions trading, got nothing to do with the carbon price. It's just straightforward economics. Our currency is carbon. That's what we want to reduce. Uh, but we don't want to spend more than we need to spend to get to that particular carbon target. So we use um, our, our financial mechanism, which is different to what the private, se private sector is looking at it purely from a financial point of view. We look at it from a cost of carbon abatement point of view. That's how we believe we're going to get to our green infrastructure plan targets. Mm -hmm.